the method has been known to man for centuries that little organisms around can change one thing into something quite different. In biotechnology, essentially we are using the life processes of living organisms to produce a product. You're just harnessing nature's ideas, nature's way of tackling various problems and then using technology to bring that to the fore. Biotechnology has endless applications. This is the science of this century. Microorganisms are present everywhere. Around for more than 3.5 billion years, these single-celled organisms are acknowledged as the oldest life forms on the planet. Among them, Bacteria are the most numerous. In a handful of soil, one can find over 10 million of these bugs. Bacteria are also known to have adapted to every type of environment and live everywhere. These bugs, magnified around a million times under the electron microscope, are being used to break down one of the most toxic substances known to man. During first Gulf War and during recent Gulf War, there's a huge oil spill is in the desert. When the oil spill will occur, it will spread. So whatever living thing is there in the water or soil, they will, they will not get oxygen, so they will immediately, they will die. At the Energy Research Institute, through a series of experiments, it took a team of scientists six years of research to develop a combination of different bacteria that would break down the hydrocarbons in crude oil to a simpler, and comparatively less toxic substance, carbon dioxide. This cocktail is what they call the oil zapper. Wherever oil contaminated site is there, from there we got these bags. So we selected four different bags and we make a cocktail out of this, these four bags. Initially the response was not very increasing. Then with the great difficulties, this Mathura refinery they gave us the small area. And that was really mess. It was uh, full of oil. It was uh, oil was floating on the on the land. And we applied these bags, and within one month it was completely clean. Now in India we are supplying uh, to all the oil industry. The team from Terry found a solution to another problem of the oil industry. From an oil well, usually only 40% of the oil can be recovered. Almost 60% of the oil remains trapped with an extremely fine pores of rock. With 82 million barrels of oil consumed a day, this recovery is imperative. Scientists at Terry developed another combination of bugs to help recover more oil. So we have to inject these bugs with the high pressure so these bugs should penetrate in the pores. And then in, in the pores, they will produce the metabolic products and they will also produce the gas. So they will create the pressure in the, in the pores and then they will displace the oil. So they will remove the oil and then oil production will increase. There are uh, such technologies available, but most of these technologies, they are working up to 60 degree temperature. But in the oil reservoir, 60 degree temperature, we will find only few reservoirs where temperature is 60. Whereas in our technology, we have developed up to 90 degree. And now we are developing, we are upgrading our technology up to 120 degree, which nobody has uh, so far. But while some bacteria are useful to mankind, others can be deadly. Anthrax is a disease of cattle, but humans can acquire it when they come in contact with diseased animals. If untreated, this disease can be fatal. The bacteria that causes anthrax is Bacillus anthracis. Among the toxins it makes that cause the disease, the bacteria produces another molecule called protective antigen, or PA, which in fact gives protection against the disease. 
Dr. Rakesh Patnagar and his team are working on a vaccine against anthrax. They've taken the gene which contains the information for the protective antigen molecule and placed it in a friendly bug, a bacteria called E. coli, which lives mostly in the human gut. By precisely cutting only the PA gene, the vaccine hence produced does not contain any toxins that a traditional vaccine would otherwise have. This minimizes side effects. But more importantly, the team has hit upon a unique method of productivity. We take this genetically engineered bacteria and put it in a bioreactor where we have optimized the conditions for its maximum production. And now this bug reads this information thinking that it belongs to the bug and it starts making millions of molecules which we call it protective antigen. It makes in 5 liter fermenter or bioreactor something like 10 million doses of this vaccine. The kind of productivity we have shown that is 10 million doses in a 5 liter fermenter was unprecedented. People are trying to put the gene into edible variety of plants. We are the first to express protective antigen gene of anthrax in plants. Since we are able to produce it 10 million doses at the laboratory scale fermenter of 5 liter, if the same technology is expanded to 500 liter fermenter, it can make something like a billion doses per day. And if the fermenter is run for 6 days, it can make 6 billion doses, which will be enough to immunize the whole world against this disease. We are using different bugs for different products. It depends on the kind of vaccine we are developing. We constantly had to look for new microbial bugs, so to speak, to, to look for new enzymes. This is the richest place you can find all sorts of bugs. I have bugs which can do wonders in this country. If you get more and more new bugs, you know, you'll be able to develop more and more new molecules. The advantage for us today is all this can be patented. So we stand a good 45 to 50% of, of, uh, you know, of the procurement for the UNICEF and other global institutions. So there's a phenomenal strength in the capacities that we have developed in India. If it is science, we are among the top few. When it comes to patents, we are not pretty much there, but we are going. When it comes to our ability, for example, to manufacture, we are second to none. And particularly, low-cost manufacturing is our forte. We do have a very strong presence of ancillary industries which are supporting this industry and that is why India actually has a global competitive edge in biotechnology in the manufacturing opportunities. For instance, we have very good engineering companies in India who are all developing state-of-the-art bioreactors. Among the developing countries, I think we have the best scientific manpower and we have the best medical infrastructure in this country, out of the developing countries. We tell every child to go for education. So that's good. That means we are a knowledge-driven society. We have truly a global competitiveness when it comes to cost of innovation. I certainly believe that we have a very innovative scientific skill base. I think the world clearly recognizes that today's diseases are global diseases, so it's no longer confined to the developing world. There has to be partnering between the developing and the developed world. We have two good, wonderful partnership examples. One is White US, uh, one of the big companies in the vaccine field. They shifted the part of the manufacturing to our plant. This is the first time a multinational shifted a manufacturing base from a developed nation to a developing country.
Research to further bring down costs of vaccine production continue. At the Indian Institute of Science, scientists are working on the production of a DNA vaccine. Here, the gene to fight the disease would directly implant itself on human deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, the basic genetic material of life. This means that instead of injecting a protein from a bug to fight the disease, the human body itself would produce the protein molecule to fight a particular disease. This technology would significantly influence cost of vaccines. One of the things that in this lab is developed is a DNA vaccine for rabies. A DNA vaccine can be kept even at 40 degrees, nothing will happen. And therefore you don't have to refrigerate. Not only for storage, even for transport purposes, you don't need refrigeration. Therefore the cost comes down significantly. There have been several adjunct technologies, but the main thing is actually the ability to transfer genes across species and sex. Really revolutionized uh, this field actually. There's a tremendous amount of gene transfer activity is going on in nature, you don't see it. Therefore, the artificial genetic engineering process is not really new, except you are probably harnessing this gene transfer to a particular direction. The ability to transfer genes has inspired scientists all over the world to enhance nutrition in crops. Dr. Asis Datta has isolated a gene from amaranth, a common edible seed. This gene, called AMA1, has been placed in the potato plant. The attempt is to make a poor man's food more nutritious. Now we got that GM potato. You can find that it's a protein content is a 35 to 45 percent more protein compared to control. And also quality is very important, not only really contain of the protein. It's a quality that this protein has all essential amino acids quite high, particularly lysine and sulfur containing amino acids, which are lacking in fact other cereals. GM potato one is much more nutritious. If you have appropriate genes where plants can grow even when there is an adverse situation of a rainfall, that would make a tremendous impact to yield as well as to the economy of this country. We are not going to get more additional land for cultivation. More or less we have reached a cultivable land as reached a saturation level. And water, the more increase in land you are going to have more requirement for water. That is going to be the biggest limitation in future. The genetic material across all life forms are the same. Chromosomes, present in each cell and made up of DNA. DNA can be further broken down to its smallest unit. Four bases known as A, T, G and C. These four simple bases join to form pairs. Knowing the exact sequence of these base pairs is the first prerequisite to help scientists identify genes. An international consortium of 10 countries are sequencing the genome structure of rice. Of the 12 pairs of chromosomes that rice has, India's role is to write the exact sequence of the base pairs on part of the 11th chromosome. The total number of the bases in rice are 430 million bases. You can see that if we start to write those bases or letters, how thick would be a book? What I know is that in this book, India has written a chapter in which there are about 12 million letters. So that is Indian contribution. By sequencing, we know the genes. So we can select which genes are responsible for a particular trait. And then we could look for better genes. Recently, after screening rice genes, we got a gene which is induced by several stresses. Salt, cold, drought, like that. So we took that gene and placed in a model plant 
that is tobacco and try to see can it make uh, tobacco plants which are engineered now tolerant to these stresses and we found that yes that is possible. Now what is important is all the experiments which we have performed are still in our laboratory or in greenhouse. We have to still see that how they will perform in the field. India is a country which has a maximum area under cultivation of rice. We grow it almost on 40 million hectares. Uh, we have a great germplasm available, large number of variability in rice, including some of the wild rice that we call, which has got very useful genes, which can be engineered and which can be investigated by this. Even if we make 1% improvement in the yield, it will be a tremendous achievement. Another species that is the center of active research for Indian biotechnologists is Bombyx mori, better known as the silk worm. From egg to egg, the worm has a life cycle of 60 days, during which it grows in size and body weight by 10,000 times. At one stage, it produces as a defense mechanism to shelter itself during transformation, the product of such value to humankind, silk. Understanding the genetic makeup of the worm has helped scientists select traits to enhance quality and production of silk. Moths with different characteristics are carefully selected and then allowed to mate. Conventionally, silk worms are being improved for many years, hundreds of years now. But biotechnology is to do precision breeding, to add precision to the existing conventional technologies. We have integrated both classical breeding and molecular biology. As a result of this, we have already developed three hybrids. One is Swarnandra, another is uh, Kalpatarvu, and the third one is Hemavati. So the product developed by adopting this DNA technology and classical breeding, the cocoon characters are superior when compared to the traditional hybrid. And the silk yield what we are getting, the silk quality what we are getting from this hybrid is international grade silk. The silkworm serves another function, that of a bioreactor or a mini factory for protein production. Since its body mechanism converts mulberry protein into silk protein, biotechnologists are harnessing this characteristic for other chosen proteins. Because silkworm is a domesticated insect and it can be easily grown and uh, it increases in size by 10,000 times. So, if you introduce anything inside, inside the silkworm, it can produce, instead of the silk protein, it can produce this protein by so many times. Knowledge of the genetic structure across species has helped scientists understand basic life functions. A whole new world has opened up in the quest to understand the building blocks of life, from DNA to proteins. The information uncovered is fascinating. If you stretch out DNA in each cell, it would be approximately about 2 meters. So, if you take all the DNA which is contained in human body and join end to end as a stretched polymer, it might cover distance from the earth to the sun. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes which are made up of over 3 billion bases. Today, scientists know the exact sequence and location of the 3 billion base pairs of the human genome. This information has given unimaginable insight into disease and illness with far-reaching consequences on medical research. Arjun is eight years old. He suffers from what is perhaps the world's single most common genetic blood disorder, thalassemia. These are normal red blood cells. They get their color from the red pigment or hemoglobin they carry, which in turn carries oxygen to different parts of the body. Arjun's blood looks like this. While his bone marrow does produce red blood cells, due to a single genetic disorder, his cells lack hemoglobin and so are virtually empty. The gene for producing hemoglobin is present on chromosome 6 and chromosome 11. One is the alpha globin and the other is the beta globin. In the beta globin gene, just one letter or one base changes from G to C and that causes such a devastating disorder which means that the genetic material has to be so precise if it is to function normally in an individual. 
the advent of molecular testing dna testing has made all this possible by offering us the possibility of a very precise diagnosis we can use that diagnostic precision to pick up the disease in a cell even without the individual actually being born so antenatal diagnosis is the next product the cost of doing diagnostics for just confirming hemophilia would be 1/20th in india as opposed to the united states Another area of research for the Indian biotechnologist are stem cells. Stem cells are such cells which have two properties. They self regenerate. You can make more stem cells out of stem cells. Hence the word stem. And the second, you can take them and direct them largely to whatever tissue you might actually want into other cell lines. We take a little bit of the stem cells from one portion of the eye, grow it on an amniotic membrane to make a tissue which is stitchable, transparent, and will restore vision to the patient. This is called the limbo stem cell culture. In fact, we happen to be the world's largest human trial, successful human trial of adult stem cell technology. Over 200 patients, 70% success. One of the last frontiers in medical research is understanding the human brain. We earlier thought of the brain as a static organ that decayed with age. Today we know that it's a dynamic organ that transforms itself to meet the needs. So as we use a certain part of the brain more, the connections are strengthened in that part of the brain and what we don't use is pruned away. The more we use the better it gets. Anything is possible with the brain. In its 3.3 pounds of mass, the human brain holds a hundred billion nerve cells that form an amazingly intricate maze of a million billion connections. When neurons of the brain are destroyed as a result of disease, dementia sets in. Dr. Pankaj Seet is researching the destruction of nerve cells caused by the world's most deadly virus. the aids virus Dr Seth is working to understand how strain C of the aids virus moves from different parts of the body breaks the blood brain barrier and settles to use the brain as a reservoir it then infects different cells and destroys the neurons While scientists know more about strain A and B world over strain C is still comparatively unknown 90% of the AIDS population in India have the strain C. That's how we are different from the developing countries or from countries like USA and Europe where they have the strain B. As of now, 50% of the world population is affected by strain C. At National Brain Research Center, we are working on strain C virus, trying to understand how this virus causes the pathogenesis in the brain and how is it different from B. Today to understand complex biological systems, Scientists are looking at methods from various bodies of knowledge from mathematics and physics to computational sciences as well as at leads from traditional systems of medicine. Parkinson's disease was described in ancient Ayurveda uh, and a plant that was used for that uh, for Parkinson's disease uh, treatment today we know it contains the same active drug that is given to Parkinson's disease patients today which is L-dopa. The interesting thing is when you give the plant material as a whole to the parkinson's disease patients they don't have the side effect that you would see with the individual compound that's given in modern medicine. There is a wealth of traditional knowledge here and because drug discovery has become so expensive now with a risk a failure rate of 99% uh, going back to your traditions and discovering new uses of old and traditional medicines is a very powerful opportunity taking a cue from traditional medicine scientists at the indian institute of chemical biology and at days medicals are using modern methods to analyze properties that certain herbs demonstrate they've hit upon a compound 
that holds promise to combat the cause of many of today's health disorders, stress. If you ask which is the major medicine on the counter sold all over the global scenario, it is antacid. The reason is antacid is sold because there is acidity in the stomach. And why acidity is there? Because of the stress. So if you can combat the stress, you can combat the acidity also. Tresina is a herbal product. It's a polyherbal formulation based on Ayurvedic principles. And we believe it should be able to combat stress. It can be internal or external, which adversely affects the system. We have been trying to establish Tresina as an anti-stress agent in the light of today's knowledge. While earlier only effects of a product could be observed, biotechnology today has given scientists tools to understand the mechanism of action of a product, of why and how exactly it works. We are observing that what is the mechanism, how tresina is acting better than the others. That's why we are separating different compounds, wanted to see what is in this tresina, what is more making synergistically more active. Until unless we do it, the global acceptance will be not better. Herbal medicines can be an alternative to modern medicines, especially in cases of you know, chronic disease segments. A person is diagnosed to be diabetic at the age of 30, and he has to live till 80. So for 50 years, he has to have a medication, allopathic medication. And there are adverse effects. They're, they become refractory, like you need higher doses to get the same effects. And in those areas, herbal medicines could become, could turn out to be very good alternatives, singly or in combination with allopathic drugs. To find new and better drugs is the quest of today's science. Knowledge of genes and their functions lends precision to this quest. Medicine aims at becoming predictive and tailored to the genome of each individual. Yet, there is still so much not known. What makes one individual more susceptible to disease over another lies in 0.1% of a genome that measures 3.2 billion base pairs. To analyze this data and to find the location of these differences is a daunting task for scientists all over the world. When we study genetic diseases, when we sample families, we need to get blood samples from members of these families. I've worked in the US and members of families are dispersed all over the United States oftentimes and therefore to be able to collect uh, blood samples from members of uh, the same family becomes very difficult. One may need to travel several thousand miles. Here we have this advantage that members of a family stay together and that's a major advantage. The India has a strategic advantage because to identify the variation, we need to have large population, large families, and large number of children per family. You can see the way our marriage pattern that takes place. Our marriage pattern decides an endogamy, and we have this endogamous group who are isolated populations. And thereby we have a unique opportunity in this area to look for gene discovery, which is a very hard job. trying to leverage the cutting-edge technologies in computer science and uh, software to, uh, to build very specialized uh, tools that can improve the efficiency and uh, the success rate of finding new drugs. Bioinformatics requires mastery of three components, knowledge of computers, knowledge of biology and knowledge of mathematics and statistics. India probably has more people that fit this bill than anywhere else in the world. India is making its mark in bioinformatics and the investment required for the field is very limited. You need computers, you need storage, you need networks. This infrastructure is already coming up because of the IT boom happening in the country. So I only see a future that is going to get brighter. last 10 years we have heavily invested in putting in our universities and research institutes some world-class equipment. Not 
this century, but I think many next centuries will belong to biology and biotechnology.